to today's trainer education webcast, The Dynamics of Rapport, Using Neurolinguistics to Improve Communication, hosted by HRDQ and presented by Mr. Jim Eicher. Before we begin, please note there is a question and answer button located at the top right-hand corner of your screen. You may use the button during the webcast to submit questions. We will either answer your questions as we receive them during our Q&A session at the end of the presentation or by email after the session. Today's webcast will last approximately 55 minutes, and we will include a brief Q&A session if time permits after the session. Please stay tuned at the conclusion of the broadcast for an exclusive offer. My name is Sarah Montgomery, and I will moderate today's webcast. I'm in business development for HRDQ, a publisher of research-based training solutions that improve the performance of individuals, teams, and organizations. Today's presenter is Mr. Jim Eicher a respected author, consultant, and subject matter expert in the fields of sales, organizational strategy, leadership, and communication. Jim's professional career includes leadership roles at Booz Allen Hamilton, Anderson Worldwide, and Symantec, and he is currently a senior manager of organization development for a large technology firm. Jim is also the author of the highly acclaimed book on management communication, Making the Message Clear, as well as several assessment tools, including the Leader Manager Profile and the Neurolinguistic Communication Profile. Welcome, Jim. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you today. And good morning to everybody out there. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to, uh, to tune in today. I think we're going to have a lot of fun this morning on the webinar. Uh, what I wanted to do is just give you a very brief background as far as my relationship with uh, neurolinguistics. Um, some of you might be familiar with neurolinguistics or NLP, and that was actually developed back in the mid-1970s at UC Santa Cruz by John Grinder and Richard Bandler. And I happened to be an undergraduate student there and started uh, learning as they did when they went along. And so uh, here I am today, um, and here we are still, uh, still finding an incredible amount of value out of, uh, out of neurolinguistics and uh, the applications that it has to business and communication. So with that, I actually want to blast into, uh, into the content here. So uh, if, we, if we move on to the next slide, uh, what today's seminar is, is it's designed for you to not necessarily have any understanding of N the NCP or NLP or, uh, or any of those topics. And it, it, it's really designed, even in a webinar format, for you to understand, well, how do I really uh, make sense uh, out of communication using this model? And once I understand that, how do I apply it to different aspects of business? Uh, but before I, I actually get into that, it, I guess the, 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 the big takeaway with that is you don't necessarily have to have familiar with NLP or NCP or report. But uh, I, I do like to take a pulse here and just sort of get an idea of uh, how many of you out there are familiar with the NCP or have used, uh, used it at all. So we're going to launch our first uh, survey here. And so we'll get going with that. And uh, I'm going to give you guys a few minutes here to uh, I see some numbers coming in. So some of you may have actually used this. Some of you may have been in a training class. And uh, some of you, uh, you know, have just had somebody talk about it uh, that, uh, that has, um, you know, used it before. So OK, so I see those numbers are coming in. And we have some people out there that are familiar with the uh, NCP, but it seems that most of you aren't. So as I said, this is really designed today for you to uh, uh, understand about neurolinguistics and rapport without familiarity to the NCP. So what you're going to see on this page here is a, a, a kind of a classic model of, of NLP that talks about how people take in information, how they process it, and how they output it. And that's actually the, the, the guts of the presentation that we're going to go through today. And we're going to kind of break this down as we go through and then come back to it at the end here. Now, one of the other things that I like to do is, is there's many con uh, concepts that are kind of out there in the ether uh, in terms of being familiar with uh, NLP. And some of them are so out there uh, in terms of being in the day-to-day -day vocabulary of, of people in training and people in OD. Uh, phrases like rapport and mirroring and, and visual, auditory, and kinesthetic learning and thinking styles that you don't even know they're associated with NLP. But I also do like to get a chance uh, here of, of, of uh, getting a sense of how many people are, are familiar with rapport. Uh, briefly here, 
you know, a lot of us have had this experience where you meet somebody and you just start naturally getting along with them, um, even if you don't think they would. Like maybe their politics are different or their views that are, are on life and religion and everything else are different at work. But, you know, you still get along uh, uh, just the same. You know, you sort of this natural uh, camaraderie. And then a lot of us have that experience, uh, unfortunately, maybe too often, is that you, you meet somebody and you go, gosh, I'm really going to get along with this person. You know, we think about the same things, we like the same stuff, and a few minutes later you go, you just don't want to be around them anymore. You can't stand them. I, fortunately, I, I, I hope some of you don't work with people like that, but sometimes you do. So what's going on here at sort of an unconscious or intuitive level is this idea of rapport. It's this process that goes along here. So again, I want to take a quick pulse and see how many of you are familiar with the concept of rapport. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to get uh, get some of these data in here. Okay, I see out here. This is very interesting because that's why I say these concepts are, are you know, for lack of a better phrase, are sort of out there in the ether. And uh, so I see that almost all of you out there are familiar with the concept of rapport, even though you might not have used the NCP. So what we're going to do today is kind of show how those fit together in the NLP model. And um, I think that will be of, of, of great value to you. So with that, what we'll do is um, we'll move on here in a second to the next slide. And uh, that's, let's, let's start to put this here in a context. So we all have the experience of what I call first contact or what we are familiar with in communication really the, the, the uh, first impression here. So let me talk a little bit about my thinking about first impressions. Now, first of all, first impressions operate always on imperfect information. Even though uh, you, you may know something about uh, uh, this, this person, you may have experience with them, uh, you may know something about them from somebody else, there's always some information missing that's part of the transaction that goes on. The second piece is that um, there's always potential for long-term relationships. You may think to yourself, no, nah, you know, it's really not going to matter if I have rapport or how I behave with this individual. Um, you know, I'm not going to see them again or talk to them again. And, you know, how many times, you know, even sometimes weeks, months, or years later, you run into somebody. Or those of you that sort of work in the same geographic area, and let's face it, you know, if a lot of you are from HR and education tuning in here, it's a small world out there. So, you know, even where I work out in the Silicon Valley, you know, you, we all run into the same people in those areas after a while. So you, you've got to be a little bit careful uh, in knowing that, you know, there may be some long-term relationship there. The next thing is there's always a short-term tension. Uh, when you make that contact, there, there is that unknown. You don't know how it's going to turn out, and there's a little bit of tension there. So how does this fit with report? Well, the takeaway here is it, it really the ideal for me in terms of this webinar is that I'd like to be the outcome of your first impression with somebody to be rapport. In other words, with that first contact, with that first impression, you are deliberately and intentionally uh, being able to establish and engage someone and build that rapport relationship with them. So that's what we're really going to uh, break down and learn about today. And with that said, um, we'll go to the next slide. And what we have here is that, you know, we all have intuitions about rapport. In other words, you know, almost all of you were familiar with rapport and we talked about it here. So my guess is that, you know, it's not that, you know, necessarily in, in this phrase I'm going to use throughout this, it's this conscious competence about rapport, but you do have an intuition here. So if you look at, it, at the uh, column A and column B here, you're going to see, you know, pairs of people doing different things. But what I want to say here is that your intuition, your sense of rapport, is actually based on whether you're conscious of them or not. It's behaved on behavioral observations that you make about posture, about facial expression, about voice quality, all kinds of things. So just look at, at, at column A and column B and see what you see is familiar there. And I've grouped them. Uh, now, this is just my grouping, so I'm just asking you to look at it. I'm just going to talk to you about my intuitions or my sense of this. Is that I think you know the people in column A are, are in rapport at least when you compare them to the people in column B. So what's going on that's the same or the difference? Well, you do see, and we'll talk about this term later, you, know, you see some what we call mirroring behavior. You know, the posture is kind of similar. But the facial expressions are, are different in each one. And actually, in some of them, the body posture is a little bit different here. So the idea here, uh, as you look at these and ask yourself, what are the similarities and what are the differences, is what is going on here to indicate rapport or not? And as I said, let, what I mentioned 
earlier was this idea of conscious competence. So basically, if you have an intuition and it's correct, what, what is kind of underlying that is most of us go through life with what I call unconscious competence. In other words, if you get it right oh, 50, you know, 50 percent of the time or more, you're going to do okay, all right? And that's much better than what I call unconscious incompetence, in which you're not only clueless, you're clueless about being clueless. You are completely don't know what's going on. Now, if you ever known or are or, or around people like this, you want to get away from them as quickly as possible. And what we're trying to move you here in this webinar is to what I call conscious competence. In other words, you know what's working, you know why, you know what's not working, and you know why. And if it's not working, you know exactly what to do to make it work. So I guarantee you that at the end of this, in another 45 minutes, you're going to have a much better sense of that than you had coming in here. So given this introduction here, let's go on here and go over some of the uh, actual uh, agenda items for today. So we've already gone over first contact. Uh, now we're going to go over the webinar outcomes. Uh, the first thing is I'm going to give you kind of a standard definition of what, we, what rapport is. And then we kind of break this into two big chunks. One is under rapport and relationships. And that's this whole idea of how do I recognize what another person's communication style is? And how do I become flexible and match with that style in such a way that I develop rapport? Then I'm also going to talk about the rapport cycle, which is that all interaction fits in a framework. And I'm going to briefly go over with you what that framework looks like in terms of this model and a little bit of the relationship to some other models. And then the other big chunk on here before we talk a little bit at the end about some applications and, and some, uh, some uh, planning, future planning, is this another couple of phrases you might have heard, relationship to NLP, which is pacing and leading. And we're really going to talk to you here about that's the output part. In other words, if now, Jim, that's great. I can recognize styles. I can recognize when people are in and out of rapport. But how do I actually change behavior, my behavior, other people, other people's behavior, so that I can match fit with them and make the kind of changes, practical, pragmatic, proactive changes that I need to build rapport? And we're going to go over those as well and spend some time on that. So let's briefly go over some high-level outcomes for the webinar here on the next slide, slide seven. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to identify communication and thinking preferences of your coworkers and customers. Uh, if any of you are out there in sales, um, do a lot of work with uh, NLP and sales, I think you'll find this valuable. But we will go over and, and, and uh, what those communication and thinking styles are, are for NLP. Um, we're going to talk about how to be, as I said, more flexible. And the key thing here is flexible for you to reach mutually beneficial outcomes for you and your client, your coworkers, your boss your subordinates, whatever context you're in. And I will guarantee you that at the end of here, you will understand how some people interact and why they're doing what they're doing better than they do. And uh, uh, you know, let me know if you don't think that's the case, but uh, I, I guarantee you that they, we will do that. Again, what we're really trying to get here is, is to the point of conscious competence. So what is rapport exactly here? What do we mean by rapport? So um, kind of a standard definition here. Uh, I'm just going to read to you. Report is a state shared by two or more individuals whose behavior, thinking, and values come into alignment regardless of the content of their desired objectives and outcomes. Now, the, the key here is that it kind of it doesn't matter what the content is. It doesn't matter what you're talking about, what problem at work you're trying to solve. It's that you have that natural job and that natural instinct behavior that gets along. Now, within the NLP model, like a lot of models, like Myers-Briggs, like this, like situational leadership, you know, how does this work within that model? Well, there's two big pieces here. One, the first step is in, in establishing rapport is recognizing someone else's communication and thinking style. That's A, and that's what we're going to do first part of this morning. And the next thing is how do I develop flexibility and style fit with somebody else? You know, the key takeaway here is that research by Gringer and Bandler and a lot of other research since, since then uh, says this. You can differentiate people that are high achievers from people that are that do okay, but they're not they're not the the Olympic athletes. They're not top of their field in, in sales, uh, CEO, that sort of thing. So there are some some behavioral differentiation. One of the key behavioral differentiations of the ultra successful are that they not only recognize intuitively what somebody else's style is, but they learn to adapt and fit with that style very quickly. They're versatile. He used kind of a Wilson learning phrase, if you're familiar with that, or flexible, to fit their style. It's just 
match fit that goes on. So what the NLP model does that I think is very good is it breaks that down into very isolated, learnable chunks of behavior. So key thing there, style, fit, and flexibility. So real quickly here then, let's just talk about some applications. Um, you know, so much so, so what here? How can I apply this to work, management, leadership, customer relationships, personal life? Well, there's a, a lot of different ones here. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, work life, uh, establishing rapport is very good for conflict management and conflict mitigation. Uh, if you want to turn it around, you know, if you have rapport with people, conflict is less likely. And actually, if you do have really good rapport with them, you can actually get in some good uh, creative uh, conscious uh, uh, contention and uh, mitigate that and come out with some very creative outcomes. Report really works there. Uh, also, coaching, mentoring, any of those kinds of relationships. And very important, not just in management, but uh, for those of you that are in sales, it is impossible to close a deal without rapport and trust. And rapport really fits into building trust with people. And as I say, it's impossible to close a sale uh, without rapport. So very, very important in, in, in that sense. So we have a number of applications here. So what does this look like in the NLP model? So let's let's take a look at this on the next slide. Now, you know, all of the, and I, I'm, I'm assuming all of you out there have used various instruments and various models, whether they're from HRDQ or somebody else. And, and, and all these models have components. You know, Myers-Briggs, you know, these pieces of that, situational leadership, DISC. Uh, now, in the NLP model, like when we ask, recognize styles, Jim, what does that mean? Fit and flexible to what exactly? Well, in the NLP model, a really key piece is this idea of visual, auditory, and kinesthetic thinking and learning and communicating, that you have an orientation towards one of these sensory modalities. And that's actually what makes up your style, and that's actually what you're fitting to when you go through that. So the big question here as we launch into this is, that's great, Jim, I get it, styles based on this visual, auditory, kinesthetic, but how do I know? Hey, you know, it would be great if I could just go around and give everybody an instrument and they could answer that and then I could take a look at it, analyze your style and come back and communicate with them, but that's not the way it works. We're in real time, we've got real time stuff to do. What is going on out there in which I can just pick up on what the style is so I can recognize it and then eventually become flexible and versatile enough to fit with another person's style. So if we go to slide 11, there's really four key areas here that, that to, uh, in order to do this, and we're going to go over those. Now, the main takeaway here is that these are cues. We're going to go over cues, behavioral cues, and that cues are clues. I'll say it again, cues are clues. So what are some of these? We've got four blocks here. The first one is habits of attention. In other words, what are people paying attention to around you? Most of the time we're in our own head, we're concerned with our own stuff, but if you want to become uh, versatile, flexible, communicative, what you need to do is start paying attention to what other people are doing. What are they paying attention to? And the next thing is not only what they pay attention to, but how are they organizing their universe, themselves, their space around them, how they work. That's another cue that's a great clue. The other thing is that the language people use is not arbitrary or capricious. It also has a pattern. So the language and metaphors are also clues to you to what the person's thinking and communication style is. And the last piece uh, in here is just a lot of nonverbal cues, but this one about eyes movements, and we'll go over that, actually is a pretty good indicator of how, not what, but how people are thinking about things. And we'll spend some time going over that again. So the main thing here is we're going to go through and break this down now, but the are cues that are clues. So the first one here is, is habits of attention. And that has to do with literally what are people looking at, what are they listening to, and how are they moving about and feeling about things here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a couple of uh, uh, brief examples around this so that you can, for the visually inclined, you can get an image and, and hear some examples and get a feel for, for how this works here. So this is kind of a generic example as we go along. It's not really a, a business example, per se, unless you're, you're a particular kind of salesperson, but we'll, we'll, we'll try this one out here. So what we're going to talk about is buying a car. So if you could imagine here, it's a car showroom, you know, and um, cars are on display, and you're the car salesperson, and in walks the visual buyer. And the visual buyer walks up to the car, doesn't get too close to the car, kind of gets a little bit close to the car. Usually, arms may be folded, okay, not going to be touching anything, and they're going to be eyeing the car. 
They're not going to be saying anything, not going to be asking any questions, right? And they're going to kind of walk around the car, right? and look at the car, let's kind of size it up, and then they're going to stop for a moment, usually by the driver's side, and they're going to look up, kind of look off a little bit, and what are they going to be doing? Now, some of you out there that have either bought a car recently or a visual, going, I know what he's talking about. What you're doing is you're actually making a picture of yourself in the car and asking yourself, how cool would I look in this car? That's one of the checks that you have, all right? So that's the visual buyer coming in, looking at the car, not only looking at the car and looking at the inside, but imagining what they would actually look like in the car with having other people look at them, okay? So it's not saying that all visual people are narcissistic. It's just the way that, that things work. So now you're in the car, you're in the sales room, and you're the, you're the car salesman, and now you have the auditory buyer coming in. So the auditory buyer comes in, it really doesn't pay attention too much to how the car looks. As a matter of fact, may not spend a lot of time on the outside of it. May actually flick a couple things with a finger or the old thing about kicking the tires. That's a little bit more of a kinesthetic thing. We'll get to that. But what do they do? Well, they actually get in the car. What's one of the first things they do when they get in the car? Well, if they can, you know, if it's outside, they'll, they'll start it up to hear, hear how it sounds. They may turn on the radio. Uh, they may turn on the air conditioning. Uh, they may check out uh, the turn signals, how they sound. And the auditory bar will also do something kind of strange. If they will sit in the car for a moment, just completely still with nothing on. And what are they doing? They're listening to the silence in the car. They're getting a general sense of the acoustic. And the visual people out there, if you've ever had like a husband or wife or significant other that's gone into it, done that in the car and you've wondered what are they doing in there, now you understand there actually is a reason to do that. So now we have the kinesthetic buyer coming in. What are they doing? Well, they literally may kick the tires. And when they do something, a lot of times it actually freaks the car salesperson out, particularly if they spent the last two hours polishing the car, is they actually put their hands on the car and sometimes will walk around the car with their hands on the car entirely around the car. Right? They're actually getting a sense for the size of the car, not visually, okay, not by asking questions like the auditory person, you know, how does this work? That's the other thing the auditory person do. They'll ask a lot of questions or getting a lot of data. They actually are spatially feeling how big it is. Then they'll get inside, they'll bounce up and down on the seats, they'll put their hands on everything, get a sense for the controls, rub their hands over the seats, the headrest, all that kind of stuff. They even go sit in the back. A lot of times they'll actually go sit in every seat in the car. And even if it has you know, a fold-up seat, if it's a, a minivan or something, they'll go sit in that as well. So what it is here is, is, is these cues are all around you in terms of uh, what are people paying attention to? Are they looking at something? Are they listening to something? Are they moving about here? So that's the first key thing. So the next thing is, okay, that's, that's great, Jim. That's you know, the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic orientation. But what about this idea of how people chunk information? Now, chunking, some of you might have heard of that term. That's another term that came out of NLP. How do people organize their experience? You know, they, they have different ways of, of organizing it here. So, um, you know, this is, again, we've got two styles here. Um, so the information comes in visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. But once it gets into the head, what's going on here? You know, do people do things in a serial uh, way, sequence one step at a time, step by step, give me the details, let's go through it one by one, I'm very focused on the task, or are they kind of scattered parallel, like to do a lot of things at once, go back and forth on stuff, uh, very relationship oriented. So let's give an example here. And again, these are these patterns are all around here. So I'm going to give a, again a couple of kind of non-work related ones. So some of you out there, you know, I'm going to go into your house, you know, hopefully you introduce myself to you, and I'm going to walk into your kitchen, and I'm going to go and inside your kitchen. I'm going to look for a very particular thing. The first thing I'm going to look for is the spice cabinet. Okay, and some of you, you know. Interesting, you, you may not have a spice cabinet, but one of two things are going to happen. I'm either going to look for the spice cabinet and see they're not going to be there, or I'm going to open a cupboard or drawer, and there's just stuff everywhere, you know, not in any particular kind of order. But some of you out there, I'm going to open a drawer or a cupboard, and they're all going to be there in alphabetical order, right? Maybe even size, you know, the same way. Some of you maybe even go so far to only buy one brand because your visual and left brain, so everything's got to look exactly the same in exactly the same order, all right? Now, another thing that I might do is then I might uh, take it upon myself to go upstairs into your bedroom. And when I do that, I'm going to go for the sock drawer, right? And as I approach the sock drawer, one of two things is going to happen. 
I'm either going to see it kind of bulging out with some socks sticking out, and I'm going to be a little bit afraid because I'm going to open it up and it's going to explode with socks flying all over the room. Or I'm going to open it up and all the socks are going to be there, all in order, by size and by color. All right? So that's another indication here. You see you've got different examples. You know, you might think that's kind of funny, but those are cues around you. Now, the interesting thing about that is those of you that have kids, and if they organize things in a parallel way, which young kids often do, and they kind of, a lot of them will start out that way and kind of evolve into the serial thing, is they've got their socks and clothes everywhere, all over the room, drives you insane, but that's what they do. All right? But if you ask them, Johnny or Susie, can you find the green socks that you wore three weeks ago to the soccer uh, meet, they'll be able to go into that pile, crawl into the bed, and pull out that exact green sock. So is it organized? Yes. They know exactly where it is. It's organized spatially, but it's organized differently. It's not all in a nice, neat order. Now, there's lots of these cues around here. Not only do you have the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic cues blasting you, but you've got this stuff. How does somebody's desktop look? Um, you know, is their office neat? Is everything stacked? When you open their file drawers, do they barely open because they're so stuffed full of stuff or uh, in order? Another big one I have is I, I sit and watch when people boot up and I look at their um, uh, I, I look at their desktop, and, and I don't mean to be critical of all of you. Again, it's just a style. Some of you, the desktop is totally clean. There's maybe like four icons on it, all right? Some of you, there's so many icons on it, you can't even see your screensaver anymore, all right? So again, that's more of a parallel way of doing things. So these cues are all around how people dress, how they organize their space, their files, uh, everything. So again, that's, that's sort of the second big cue here, these, these uh, habits of organization. So let's go to the next one here. And again, you know, you get this in conversation, you get it on the phone, uh, email is a big thing. Uh, this is actually very helpful, by the way, those of you that are in employee communication. Uh, one of the things that's very helpful with getting across your audiences, and also particularly helpful for those of you that make a lot of PowerPoint presentations, is <clears throat> you have to ask yourself, am I presenting things in a visual, auditory, and kinesthetic format? And Am I giving people in the left brain and the right brain or serial and parallel way? And am I backing it up by using the words? So here again, I, I just want you to look at this sheet here. This is a really nice uh, uh, sort of a cheat sheet for you. It's got visual and auditory and kinesthetic words. So when people are talking to you and say, you know, I understand your point of view. That's a really, uh, 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 your idea is very clear to me. Um, you know, very, very colorful phrase. Again, you know, visually speaking, these are not arbitrary. They are telling you how people are thinking about stuff. Or if they shift and go, hey, that sounds good for me. You know, um, let's, let's, uh, let's sit down, chat about that, and uh, let, let that rattle around in my head a little bit. So again, indicating auditory. And finally, some people go, you know, I, I've, I've gotten in touch with that. I can really get a good feel for that. You know, let, you know I, I, I understand what you're saying, but let me go away and have to turn around in my gut for a couple of days and come back to you. So see, a lot of you that are listening here, one of the ways to indicate what your style is, even when you don't have some, some formal way to do it, is I'm giving you these visual auditory and kinesthetic of examples, and some of you are going, yeah, yeah, shaking your head out there. And some of you are going, get a feel for it. Sure it around in my gut, that sounds kind of strange. So that's indicating to you that that is not your predominant style. But there's a lot of people out there that are, so you need to learn to match fit with that. So again, how you, how you, how you listen to people. The idea here, Again, you know, in the short webinar here, is if we had practice, the big thing here is that you're getting used to listening, in this case, not to the content, not to the what, but to how people are talking. And that's a lot of learning style fit flexibility is getting into that how things work. So let's go into this final nonverbal cue here. And that has to do with eye movements. And a lot of you are looking at this going, well, what does this mean? This is what we used to call an NLP or still do this, this happy face. And the left side and the right side here is your orientation. So uh, if, if I were, um, you were, you were facing, facing me and, um, you know, this is how I would do it. So uh, let me just give you kind of an overview here. A lot of times, uh, again, and this is not arbitrary behavior, a lot of times when you, when you stop and uh, ask people a question, you go, well, what do you think about such and such? What they may do is they may pause for a second and go, hmm, let's see. And you probably haven't noticed this, maybe you have, but they may tilt their head a certain way or move their eyes a certain way when they do that. Or they may go, hmm, or ah, okay, I get it. And they may look away for a second. Or if 
you ask somebody, hey, have you heard that song before? Remember that? What's, what's that song? What's that, what's that one on the radio now? That guy, I, I, I can't quite remember that one. And they may kind of, kind, of, kind of tilt their head to the side, put their head down and go, and tap their foot for a second, and then look up back at you. So what is going on here is that every interaction we have every day, the pauses that we have uh, with people on the phone and face-to-face -face are not arbitrary. People are taking a couple of seconds, going into their heads, and doing one of three things, sometimes all in combination, but they may be making a picture in their head of what you're talking about, or they may be trying to retrieve a visual image. They may be you know, metaphorically going to the movies in, in their mind. A lot of people, when they think about stuff, they make pictures in their head, and they edit the pictures. Some of you out there, I know when you, you think, what you're doing is you're talking to yourself. You're having internal dialogue. And as I always say, it's OK as long as you know who you're talking to. If you don't, that's a whole other issue. See? But you do have this internal dialogue, or you hear music in your head, or you have a conversation, or you have an argument, that sort of thing. And a lot of you, when you think, you look away, um, or, 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 or pull back, literally, kinesthetically speaking, and you're, you're feeling. How does it feel? What, what's going on in my gut? Uh, is there any anxiety there? Um, and there may be some movement, some tapping, some fidgeting. Uh, some of you out there that have uh, kinesthetic kids, what's going on in class uh, when they fidget and move is they're actually calculating, thinking about things kinesthetically. Uh, the problem is, if your teachers don't know that, they're just think they're being fidgety and not paying attention. But they actually are paying attention. So as adults, we all do the same thing. So here again is another set of cues. Now, how would these work real quickly here before we move on here? One of the things that you want to do with this one, and a little bit late, uh, later you can incorporate it into when we talk about mirroring, is you want to either get in a position someplace like uh, lunchtime uh, and, uh, or some restaurant or something where you can watch people and not have to be involved and, and just watch them interact. And you will notice that they're pausing and looking away and looking in certain directions. And these directions, without going into the detail here because we don't have the time, but they do indicate generally whether people are making pictures in their head, talking to themselves, or having feelings. And this is very pow powerful information in terms of somebody's style here. Like when I, when I uh, talk to people that use this, a lot of times I'll just say, they'll look away, and I'll just ask them. I said, well, what picture were you making in your head? And they'll come right back to me and, says, and say, well, I was having this image of so-and-so. OK, so let's, uh, let's try to put a wrap around this. And what we're going to do is we're going to have an exercise here on the next slide. But let me set you up for this here because we, okay, as we go through here. So he, here it is here. So uh, before we launch the polling question, let me give you a, a, a setup for this. So I'm going to have you think about uh, solving a problem. And you've got um, you know, uh, three potential an answers you can have for this. Um, you know, if you've just been put in, in, in uh, charge of a large project, you know, usually when we're told or asked something to do at work, we have a first reaction. Now, some of you may visualize the project plan. In other words, you're, you're going to have some Gantt chart, a perch chart, some image about something in your head. Some of you are going to think of someone to talk to. Maybe you're still going to have a picture of them in your head, but what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to want to talk to them. I said I got I got to get some information. It's going to be verbal. And some of you, when you get put in charge or asked to do something, you have a, a feeling about it. it. Might be positive. Might be anxiety. So let's take a, a, another a quick survey here. And so here again, you've just been in, put in charge of a large project or organization. What is the first thing that you do? Do you visualize the project plan? Do you think of somebody to talk to? Or do you feel anxious about the responsibility? So let's take a couple seconds here. Oh, very interesting answers here. Uh, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to feedback these uh, uh, to you guys, because this is actually a very nice breakdown. When you give people tests of communication style, um, it actually breaks down pretty close to this. So uh, about a little over 40% of you say visualize. Um, uh, high 30s, think of someone to talk to. And 20s, you feel anxious about the responsibility. So we've got a breakdown here, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic uh, uh, in, in that amount. Now, a lot of you may think, well, is that fairly accurate? And believe it or not, with this one simple question, that's fairly close to the uh, statistical research we've done with uh, NLP on assessments. So again, this gives you, um, to wrap here, a sense about um, you know, your particular way, you, you, you know, that kind of that first reaction. Because that's going to indicate to you, kind of at an emotional level, uh, uh, what your communication style can predominantly be here. So let's put this in a context. And that's what I call the rapport cycle. 
So, you know, communication doesn't occur in a vacuum, and it's usually got a sequence going on here. And you've got a contacting phase, a sorting, agreeing, and a verifying phase. So in the contacting phase, you know, these are pretty, pretty uh, phase valid here. This is just, just what it says here. Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the next slide. And that contacting phase is the starting point, or if you, we go all the way back to the beginning today, that is the first impression. So you're contacting people, and that's a case where you have high outcome and low relationship. You usually, in a, and I will preface this, in a Western model of communication, uh, we're focused on the outcomes, the objectives, what we want to do. So that's, for us, when the report building process starts. The next thing is that you've got, it, it moves into, you're still focused on the outcome, but you move into the relationship part, and you've got the sorting phase. Um, and you're haggling over stuff, you're trying to figure out, you know, what, what, what a problem we're trying to solve here, what decisions are we trying to make, and that's, that experience is just sorting. Next year, we've, we've gone through that, and, and now we're, we're on to the agreeing phase where we're trying to nail down what it is that we, that we want to do. Uh, we've established rapport. We have a relationship going. And um, we're, we're clear on what the objectives are. We're just kind of, kind of cementing what that agreement is. And then finally, at the end, is the verification. In other words, the interaction is over. We basically agree to the mutually beneficial outcomes that we want. And that's the verification stage. And in, 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 in business, in our culture, you know, that's, that's a lot of times where, you, where you're going over the terms and conditions and the final sort of things here that, that uh, uh, you do in a contract or negotiation or anything like that. Now, just real quickly here, because we don't have a whole lot of time, um, for those of you that have sold or traveled in uh, uh, you know, Asian culture or, or pretty much outside of, of Western European, is a lot of times those X and Y are reversed. The relationship is, is very is, is predominant. And actually, you don't even, it's considered rude to even talk about what the objectives are until that relationship is built. And uh, a lot of people now are actually pretty hip to that. Uh, but when um, globalization really began in earnest maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, there were a lot of failures around that because, you know, people, there was a culture clash around that, and we just didn't understand why people, quote, just didn't want to get down to business. Uh, so, but the model still applies. You still go through these phases when you're doing that, and that's really um, the cycle in which you build rapport. So now we're going to go on to the second chunk for today. Uh, we've already gone over the idea of, okay, Jim, how do I know? Uh, it's been a brief, uh, brief amount of time, but I get the idea. There's cues out there that tell me visual and auditory communicating. communicating. I get how people organize stuff. Gosh, I never knew that uh, my, uh, my 10,000 icon desktop was a clue to anybody. I've got to go fix that. Uh, so you've got all that down now. So another thing is, okay, that's great. I recognize, but what do I do? How do I output? How do I change my behavior? How do I engage people? What kind of proactive things I can do? So there's a couple of main ones we're going to go over here. One is mirroring. The next one is formatting and chunking. And the third one is creating value, and we'll go over that briefly here. So let's talk about mirroring. All right, and before we do the polling question, I want to talk about this a little bit. Again, uh, if you go back to the beginning here, one of the uh, behavioral cues that you have to recognize rapport and uh, that underlies your intuition is part of your at least unconscious competence, but should be at, even at this point part of your conscious competence, is the idea of mirroring. And that's, that's literally that people are verbally and non-verbally either matching or mismatching each other, right? And a lot of times you've noticed this. You've been in a public place, you've been in a restaurant, you see people are laughing at the same time or they're angry at the same time or they're lifting up a fork at the same time or putting it down at the same time, scratching their head. Uh, it's really kind of funny when you start to notice this. You'll go into a meeting, you'll have 15 people around the room, and seven of them in a row will be sitting in exactly the same posture. All right, well, nobody instructed them to do that, but they're doing that. So we kind of naturally, naturally do that. So let's, let's go over here and launch this poll here. And the question is, have you ever noticed yourself unconsciously imitating what another person is doing? And that's like I say, you're, you're having dinner with them, and you notice that... Uh, you know, they're lifting uh, the fork at the same time, or you, you scratch yourself, or, or you're leaning back, and that sort of thing. So let me give you this one here, very interesting here. Almost 100% of you have noticed this, all right? So that's how out there it is here. So in terms of, of uh, you know, this particular uh, behavioral cue as a way. So how do you use this? Well, 
the idea here is if mirroring uh, is such a powerful way to uh, let me put it this way, such a powerful behavioral cue in indicating how people are getting along or not. What you want to be able to do is you want to be able to deliberately use it to gain rapport. So how do you do that? You consciously and intentionally mirror other people. Right? And you go, wow, you know, I can actually consciously match what they're going to do? That feels kind of weird. I think it would be awkward if I were to try to do that. And let me, let me explain how this works here. Now, if we were to do a training seminar, obviously we would be practicing all this stuff and you get a, a feel for it in kind of a safe environment. But let me make a really critical distinction here. Mirroring is not mimicry. You do not mimic what another person does. You're not Marcel Marseille being a mimic and doing exactly what they do. That not only does not build rapport, that will kill rapport, right? Because that jumps up into people's consciousness and they notice what that is. And it breaks that is. How rapport really works in a deliberate way is you go over this list, because what I've done is I've taken the whole stream of nonverbal stuff and I broke it down into, into chunks. You pick one of these things to match. One. That's it. And you always pick the one that's the most comfortable for you. So if moving your head the same as the other person and nodding is comfortable, uh, for auditory people, maybe it's matching uh, voice tone or voice, or, or voice tempo. A lot of times, a really safe one to do is if people are using visual language, I will describe what I'm thinking in visual language back to them. Right? So again, you pick one. And that's what you do, and you always pick the one that's most comfortable for you. So that's mirroring. Now, mirroring along with rapport is one of those words that's really connected with NLP. So let's go on to this, this chunking stuff. That's also another word that uh, came out of the NLP thing. Now, the main thing about this is that's great, I'm mirroring, but how do I, how do I actually change this visual auditory kinesthetic stuff? So here, here's what's going on here. Is that, I'm, I'm going to read this. Four minutes, you're actually translating you're thinking into visual, auditory, or kinesthetic format. Those of you that make a lot of PowerPoint and make a lot of presentations or do training may intuitively get this already anyway. You know that you've got to have stuff for people to look at, to listen to, to talk about, and Chaska stuff. Action movement might be part of your seminars. So I've got some examples down here of uh, you know, what some of those are in terms of visual, auditory, and kinesthetic as you're incorporating this into communication. But here's the key takeaway here. Before you go into communication and interaction, you want to you have your ideas and your important outcomes and your objectives spelled out. And you want to ask yourself these key questions. Can I make it, can I, is there some way I can make it something seen, something heard, and something felt? If you translate all your ideas into that, then you're going to go a long way towards being flexible. This is literally you're creating flexibility here. You're changing what you've done altering it so that it is flexible, it has multiple inputs to people, and it, it has a better chance of matching and fitting with them. Similarly, if you go to this idea of chunking, which goes back to the serial and parallel communication, it's the same thing. You want to scale the information up or down. All right, so there's some examples here of serial and parallel. And again, there's some really uh, uh, common verbal cues to let you know right away what people want. If you're talking to people within the first 10 or 15 seconds, they're usually going to go in one or two directions. They're going to say, make me a list. Let's go over this one by one. Can you give me a breakdown? You know, what's the details? Or they may turn and say, OK, spare me the details. What's the bottom line? I want the big picture. Let's get to the main point here. And they're usually going to go one way or the other. So again, you want to take your ideas and your objectives. And what you want to do is ask yourself that key question. And that is, is there some way I can make it something big or something small? When I go into an executive presentation, I'm at a tech company, I've always got to have Excel spreadsheet somewhere or some data table, some kind of data, right? But I also have to take that data and I have to translate it into some overarching theme as well for the few people in there in a tech company that have the, the big picture, the strategic part. So, that's what you want to do here. Again, is it something big, something small? Or there's examples on this page. So finally, what we're going to do here is we're going to, we're going to kind of wrap it together. Now, if you go to the next slide, we're going to go back to that diagram in the beginning. So let's, let's go about this here. So what you see now is hopefully at this point, if I've been moderately successful at all here, what we've got is you've got visual and auditory uh, input, how people take in information. 
how people organize it, serial and parallel and like that, and then how they output it. So some people may, um, you know, you can even do this by occupation sometimes. You can say, okay, uh, I'm an engineer, I make a picture out of something, I make a very detailed serial picture, I hand it to a manufacturing person, that's where all the kinesthetic people in the companies are hiding, and they go and actually fabricate or take a picture into something that you can touch and use and that sort of thing. So there's all kinds of different ways to translate this. But bottom line here is that uh, uh, what you have you know, on the first side is you have the habits of attention, you notice how people are doing this, and then you match fit for what they're doing by reformatting their behavior. Now, if you kind of pull it all together, you mirror people, and you format and you chunk your information to fit them, then you will go a long way towards establishing rapport. So let's, uh, we've got a few minutes here. Let's, let's take uh, uh, some time to look at some applications. And the way I've done this here is, is I've kind of just given you some stuff in this next section that I use in training seminars. So feel free to steal this. I encourage you to do that. And I'm going to just go over uh, one by one uh, quickly here what we do. So if we look at teamwork, you know, all team building seminars use some sort of communication model here. So uh, what I do, of course, because I'm biased and um, you know, I have, have the instrument out here, been using it for a long time, is so if, if, if I'm going to give people some the NCP or some sort of uh, assessment around visual, auditory, and kinesthetic styles here or have them think about it, I always have people answer these questions individually. First one is a set around self-focus on communication uh, in the NCP mo NLP model. Uh, then I have them think, you know, um, outwardly about the team. And then think about kind of a discovery mode, what are some similarities and differences. Now, so what I do is I have them answer this individually. Then I either have them get in dyads or, or larger, you know, they're not a big group, but maybe three or four people, and then talk through this stuff. What's really interesting is that in a, in a very short amount of time, people in the room educate each other about what their styles are, and there's a tremendous amount of learning going on. So I encourage you to steal this exercise and uh, use it in your seminars. So the next piece is conflict. Now, there is another term here that uh, has to do with NLP. Some of you may have heard of, and that's the idea of anchoring. And what and it, it, it's the Grinder and Bandler's name for specific behaviors that are associated with specific responses. And that can be anything, a word, a phrase, a handshake, uh, the nod of a head. Uh, uh, I even have like a mug up here. Um, you know, something that people react to strongly or not. Like, it's real interesting. Um, I work with some companies. You know, people move around. They work for different companies. They have mugs or shirts or whatever from other companies. Some companies, it's really comfortable. Like, if you're at company X and you've got stuff left over from company Y and you wear it around or whatever, they don't really care. Uh, some cultures are like, you know, if you wear anything that's not that brand from that company, you know, that is not a, that is, that's what we call a bad or negative anchor. So, again, these are triggers here. The main thing is that a positive anchor can uh, uh, help resolve, mitigate conflict, and establish rapport. A negative anchor can cause conflict or break rapport. So looking at the list here on, on this uh, uh, slide, and then if we go to the next slide here, I've got another group question for you. Is Again, I do this in seminars. Uh, don't really have time to do this here, but you can do this in your head. But I, again, I encourage you to steal this here. You know, everybody's got their positive and negative anchors. So just you know, in your head, what are some of your positive anchors and negative anchors? And specifically to do with this webinar around communication. Uh, like uh, sometimes, you know, too much detail drives people crazy. Sometimes if it's too big picture, that drives people crazy. And if you turn it around, that's the positive. It's like, wow, they gave me that, uh, that Gantt chart, that Excel spreadsheet. Love it. I, when I work with engineers, we only work with Excel, no PowerPoint allowed. I go to marketing, we just do PowerPoint. And those are negative and positive anchors, uh, visual ones and, um, you know, chunking ones that are, that are very important. So this final thing here in terms of application has to do with on the phone. Now, we're not necessarily on the phone as much as we, we, we've been. You know, we had a very auditory technology uh, voicemail about, what, 20 years ago now, 20, 10 to 20 years ago, and we, we've switched very rapidly in the last 10 to email and gotten much more visual. But we still do spend time on the phone. And uh, it is important, uh, um, particularly, uh, you know, help desk and uh, chatting with people. Uh, how, how, do, how do you make this medium work? Because, you know, for the visuals, gee, I can't see them. What do I do? The kinesthetics, I can't get close to them. I've just got this device here. What do I do? 
So what you again, you, what, what you do want to do is you want to take your objectives and you want to figure out how can I talk about how things look, how they sound, and how they feel, and how can I translate that. So if you hear that someone on the other end of the phone is talking visual language, you want to talk and problem solve back with them about how things look. Similarly, you want to do things about how things sound if they're auditory. Or I usually ask people too at the end, just kind of throw it out there. I said, well, are you, are you feeling okay or how does this just feel right? And uh, you know, if somebody's on the phone and it's kinesthetic and they get that, that goes, that alone, that phrase goes a long way towards, uh, towards building rapport. So if you go to the uh, um, last slide here, actually second to the last slide, what I have is a model that kind of wraps this all together here. So in terms of the dynamics of rapport and how to develop it and how do you establish rapport with other people, the steps here is first is a diagnose style, and then it specifically has to do with the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. You fit with other people's style. That has to do with recognizing what that is and figuring out how you're going to format and rechunk your information. You figure out what their needs and outcomes are, not yours, but what theirs are. All right? It's not all about you. It's about them. That's what's in their mind. You figure out what those are, incorporate it into your communication, and then you develop flexible responses depending on what their communicating and thinking style is here. So to wrap it up for today, and then we've got a little time for Q&A here, is that the, the key takeaway with this one here is right at the top, is that rapport over time equals trust. And if you establish and build that rapport over time, you will create the glue of the relationship whether it's a virtual relationship or face-to-face, -face, you will have that trust. It's very, very important for all the kinds of things we do at work. And then specifically to wrap here, I hope that you have a better understanding of coworkers and clients and how they think. Um, you may say, oh, that's what Max does or that's, that's what uh, Samantha does. Okay, I get it now. She's really visual. That's why she, she likes or he likes so-and-so. Uh, you've gotten this idea of conscious competence. You, you have some idea now of what's working, what's not working, and why, and what to do about it. And that automatically kind of feeds into creating uh, an ease and a versatility or flexibility around your communication as you're going forward here. So I think we're, uh, we're pretty close to the end here. I've got one more thing for you to do before we uh, uh, wrap it up. And that's, again, something I encourage you to steal. And I have a game, a game planning uh, page. And after I do a seminar, what I like to ask people is, what are they going to do differently over the next 30 days based on what we've gone over? So the, the way I set this up is to start, stop, and continue. What are you going to start? What are you going to stop? And what are you going to continue? What outcomes? What do you want to get out of that? And it's not just, hey, I want to do this, but, but why are you going to do this? And then what's your metric? How are you going to keep score? and do that. And I've actually found that this is actually a fairly good performance device uh, for individuals um, as a roadmap here for making changes, uh, developing some metrics, and how those metrics fit with objectives. So again, I encourage you to steal this. And at this point, I want to return it back over to Sarah. I want to thank you very much for your time and uh, for tuning in and uh, taking time out of your day. Uh, take care, and, and feel free to send uh, Sarah any questions that you have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jim. We do have some time for questions, so feel free to send those in via your chat box, and we'll review through those. Ones that we're not able to answer live today, um, we will respond to all questions by email as well. So go ahead and send those in. Um, Jim, our first question here comes from Rita, and she's asking about more ideas on mirroring in remote situations, so things like email communications, um, uh, virtual meetings, but more in the remote situations, um, that mirroring element. Well, first off, that's a, that's a great question, and of course, people who do seminars always say that's a great question, but but it is. Um, you are, let me, let me be honest with you here, you, you are limited, obviously, um, you know, especially now with, you know, there's so much globalization here and, and, and remote management and that sort of thing. There's a couple things you can do. One is obviously, if you do get people on the phone, or if you do actually do like a webinar like this with them and you sh sh or share, just share some stuff back and forth, you want to make sure your presentation you know, ma matches them. You want to make sure you're, you're, if you're talking to them, really th th how they're thinking, their voice, tone, and tempo, determining are they visual, au auditory, kinesthetic, how do I frame my questions. And then finally, because we use email so much, 
e email is also a key way to do it. Uh, what I find is really important on email, uh, almost more than the, the, if you're just thinking of email text, the, the key takeaway here is the chunking piece. Not so much visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, because by its nature, it's, it's visual. I mean, if images help or presentations help, uh, if, if something to look at helps, obviously attach that to the email. But what I find out is brief email or long email, all right? Um, that's really the turn on or the turn off, the negative or positive anchor on that. Like a lot of executives, I never send them a long email. Just not, not going to work. So that's, that's the thing. Is, and, and, and what you want to do is mirror, mirror that. If they send you a long one, they send you a short one. Let me put it this way. If they send you something terse and short and you send something back long and wordy, not going to work. All right? So that's how you want to use that. Pay attention to kind of the, the, the chunking aspect of the email. Okay, are there any other questions? Uh, we do. We have a couple more that have come in. It seems um, naturally we would have some trainers on the line. So we have a couple people sending in questions that are around presenting. So when you're in a training classroom um, setting potentially or you're running a lecture, how then do you establish that rapport? Well, there's a good question again. There's a couple of ways. Um, I'm going to give you two things here. One is, is how do you establish rapport and then sort of how do you you uh, figure out, you know, what kind of composition you have in the room um, without giving the NCP. The one thing that you want to do to establish rapport is that you actually want to start out and iterate the seminar that you're doing, the training class, and its objectives in all three formats. And you want to cycle through that pretty rapidly. In other words, if you have a set of objectives, you want to visually show them what that looks like. You want to talk to them about it. And then you want to be moving around physically, I know a lot of people think in front of the room, but if it's a training, usually the moving around helps. And if you've got stuff, you want to you spend, even if it's five seconds, having people, quote, unquote, kinesthetically speaking, walk through the stuff. So if you've got a finder there, or you've got PCs, you want hands-on, or hey, let's open this up and look here. Here, here's a, so you're doing two things. You're doing the kinesthetic, they're touching it. You may have them look at something in particular, and then you talk to them about it. And as you get this cycle over and over again of VAK, the visual auditory kinesthetic, that's going to start building rapport with the group. There's other things you can do, but that's the key one starting off. Because if you just stay in one modality when you start off, you will automatically have, remember these stats we have, you, you'll start to lose 40 to 50% of the room. Great, thank you. And, and then our last question, we've had a couple um, variations of this question come in, so I'm going to kind of summarize it a little bit. Um, but people are finding that in their, their work life versus their home life, they're um, noticing different trends, whether it's where, how they take in information or they organize information or they um, produce information, um, that there is a, a difference between that, what they see in their home style versus their work style. Is there anything you could do to kind of speak around that a little bit? Yeah, that, that actually, that, that is a great question. Um, I'm smiling here. You can't see it. Uh, but um, the like when you're at work and when we're talking about stuff at work, and actually one of the questions, if you ever give out the NCP, this exact question will come up, I would say, 100% of the time. Um, how you communicate at work may be very different than as soon as you get in the car or the train or whatever and go home. It may be a 180. You may be really left brain at work and right brain at home or vice versa. Uh, most people get a whole lot more kinesthetic when they go home because they can feel when they go home. They can relax uh, or they got kids or, or, or whatever. So just one thing I want to say about that is that it will be different, all right? And that's not unusual. It's not right or wrong. It's just different if you, know, if you notice that. Um, but with that in mind, then you've got to think that the takeaway here is my rapport strategy for home may be very different than my rapport strategy for work, because you've got this other little unit there, um, even if it's just your dog, and, and, and it's, it has different requirements than, than work. But yes, th that switch is, is very common. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Jim. If we did not get to answer your question, you will receive an emailed response directly. Feel free to contact us with additional questions or feedback on today's webcast.
And we do have an exclusive offer. You will receive 25% off any neurolinguistic communication profile product at our website, hrdq.com. Use the coupon code NCPWebcast. It's all lowercase with no spaces. We do appreciate your time today, and we hope you found today's webcast informative.